Well, as campaign season heats up, hope for bipartisan compromise on pretty much anything goes out the window. But Republican Senator Marco Rubio wants to break the gridlock on one of the most divisive issues in Washington, immigration reform. The Florida freshman is working on an alternative to the Democratic Dream Act. And I asked him earlier what kind of progress he's making on Capitol Hill. The first thing is to recognize is we do have an illegal immigration problem, and people are rightfully frustrated by it, and that's why I support security and enforcement, e-verify, and things of that nature. On the other hand, uh, we do have some people in this country that are in a very unique position, and the, so the first step I'm trying to make is to deal with children, basically, that were brought here at a very young age through no fault of their own, find themselves here undocumented. This is a compromise on the so-called DREAM Act. Right, which is designed to help kids who, through no fault of their own, find themselves in these circumstances that they're in, and all I'm trying to do is help these kids do right what their parents did wrong. So if they if they serve in the military or go to college, they would be put on a path to citizenship. Well, the way we're envisioning it is if you graduate from high school, and obviously there's a military component to it, but that's not very controversial. But the part I think we'll have the most debate is if you graduate from high school and you haven't committed any felonies and you've been here for a certain period of time and entered before a certain age, we will give you a non-immigrant visa in order that basically allows you to stay in this country legally. It's a so form you of can a green card? Uh, well, no, it's not a green card. It's a non-immigrant visa, which is what we give like a student visa okay. and it allows you to stay in the United States and complete your studies after some period of time in the future after you've been here we're, we're still debating how long that should be at that point you would be like any other non-immigrant visa holder in the country you would be allowed if you want to to apply for a green card but you'd have to do it through the existing system not through some special path because that's the complaint about amnesty but how that, that I want to ask you about the amnesty because what would be your response to those who say look anybody who is illegally here who doesn't first have to return to their country of origin and wait in line like everybody else is being given a form of amnesty if they're allowed to stay here and get on a path to citizenship. Well, I think there's a difference that we've long recognized in this country, for example, in the case of refugees, between the people who have chosen to break the law and be here illegally and those who were either brought here by their parents or by circumstances. And these kids didn't know. When you're 12 years old, when you're 8 years old, you don't choose to come to this country illegally. Many of these kids don't even know they're undocumented until they graduate and try to go to and no one's ever told them that. So obviously this doesn't apply to people who as adults came to this country or as older teenagers came to this country. It would have to be minors when they It would have to be here. minors when they entered. They would have to have lived here consecutively for a significant period of time, invested in our society, graduate from their high schools, not have any criminal record, and then all you get is a non-immigrant visa. That eventually, in the future, at some point, you would be allowed to apply for a green card, but you'd have to apply through the existing normal process, not a special pathway. All right, now this is going a fair ways, at least in my my estimation to what the White House has asked for with the DREAM Act, and yet they're resisting uh, your compromise. I think they've actually stated, at least a senior aide has, that they don't like what you're doing. Why? Well, I think there's some politics involved, no doubt, to the shock of many who may be watching they, this program. That they want to use the DREAM Act politically? I think there are the some. In the, I don't want to say all. Look, there are people in the Democratic Party that I think legitimately want to help these kids. There are some that were counting on this issue to use on the campaign um, and to use against Mitt Romney and the Republican Party. And I don't, see the, I don't think they want, they want there to be a reasonable Republican an alternative because it takes away that argument. Uh, but I think we have plenty of other issues to debate. I think this is one that we should take off the table and try to solve. And, and I hope, certainly in the last few days, I've heard more promising tones from many of my Democratic colleagues and a willingness to work together to find a solution for the kids. All right. Let's uh, change subjects to foreign policy. You're on the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, do, you, do we know, uh, have you been told at all on the committee that uh, uh, who leaked the news, whether it was Pakistan or an American, about the the doctor, Pakistan doctor, uh, who, Afridi, who helped us capture bin Laden. No, but I think it's concerning. This is not a person who had done anything against the interests of Pakistan. This is someone who was, you know, basically helping uh, to capture a criminal and, and a, someone who had done great harm and killed Pakistanis or been involved in the death of Pakistanis. I think that the capture and, and, and ultimately the death of bin Laden was beneficial not just for the United States but for Pakistan and the world. And I don't think he's done anything wrong. And I think it's very troubling what's happening to him. But was it um, you? U.S. intelligence policy mistake not to get him out of there once uh, we knew that they were being looking at him. Well, some of these issues will always be discussed with the intelligence community, and I'm always cautious about speaking about those things because I don't ever want to be the source of something that on undermines future operations. Suffice it to say that, at least for now, I am satisfied that the U.S. is not to blame for what's happened, and I, I think now that the world knows about it, that the pressure should be brought on Pakistan to treat this gentleman fairly. He has not committed any crimes or treason against Pakistan. He did not act against the national, national interest of Pakistan. 
on, um, he, he shouldn't be in jail. But why would anybody, any average citizen, much less somebody who's taking the risk of life and limb in a country like Pakistan or anywhere else in the world, help us again if this well, is what right. happens to somebody who does help us? Well, and we didn't get him out of that country in time. I think that's right, and I think that's the concern about future operations, is that this could serve as an example to others that cooperating with the United States could lead to a very bad outcome for you and for your family. And we depend on these sorts of relationships all over the world to not just gather intelligence, but to conduct operations. So there's concern about the implications. But you're this not could have. willing to criticize the administration, it seems, for, for not getting him out. Not yet. I think that, uh, well, because we certainly need to see how it plays out. And I think they've taken a forceful position in terms of their position vis a vis Pakistan. But there are other issues at play here that we probably couldn't publicly discuss that make the issue a little bit more complicated than is publicly known. But let me just say that I'm not prepared to, to make those criticisms. I think the important thing now is not to play politics with this issue, but to get that gentleman outside of the predicament that he is in, because he has done nothing wrong vis-a-vis -vis the government or the sovereignty of Pakistan. All right, let's talk uh, briefly about Syria. They have, uh, as you know, they had the massacre in Hula uh, on the weekend. Uh, sh do you agree with John McCain, your co Senate colleague, that the U.S. should consider the use of force on a no-fly zone? Well, I, I agree that we should take a more forceful position than we have already. I'm not prepared to engage the United States in a military operation there, but let me say the fundamental problem in Syria now is that the opposition whether it's the military or the political opposition, is not cohesive and unified. And so the best thing the United States can do working with our allies is to create the conditions so that the opposition can become more cohesive and more unified. And that means encouraging the Turks and our allies in the region to create a safe zone in their territory so that the Free Syrian Army, so that the political uh, leaders there that are opposing the Assad regime can begin to organize themselves. And I think we can provide them resources such as communications, food, uh, you know, but humanitarian not, support. I think our allies are prepared to arm but them. But not military aid. Well, I think our allies are prepared to do that, and we should encourage them to do that. I don't think that necessarily U.S. aid uh, in a military form directly to a non-cohesive force or prepared to do that right now. Step number one for us should be to help the opposition unify, coalesce, and become more cohesive in their operations. And we can do that through a, a Turkish side of the border free zone, a uh, safe zone, combined with the kind of communications and logistical support that we can provide. And then once you have a cohesive opposition, then I think there'll be more options on the table available to us. Okay, Senator Rubio, thanks so much for being here. Thank you.